Welcome. This is Amy Hines speaking. Joanne and I are pleased to be here with you today. And as you might surmise from the graphic in front of you, we are referring to the field of medicine and we'll draw a bit on the work of Atul Gawande, the author of The Checklist Manifesto. His work has transformed healthcare as well as other sectors with the introduction of a simple solution to manage complex projects, The Checklist. The overarching metaphor for today's webinar is performing surgery on your annual giving program. In a medical context, however, surgery is often seen as a treatment of last resort. So in addition to surgery, we'll explore alternative treatments such as medication, counseling, and massage as we explore best practices as well as common pitfalls in an annual giving program. It's helpful to start with a common understanding of the term annual giving, and this particular definition comes from AFP's Online Resource Center. The key concepts are that it is fundraising on an annual basis, and uh, I like to give particular emphasis to the carefully chosen verbs of broaden, upgrade, and build philanthropic support. Most of our clients' annual giving comprises giving strategies for individuals as well as foundations, companies, and other organizations. Keep going, Joanne. There is one additional definition that we'd like to look at. Um, the previous definition alludes to the valuable role that annual giving plays in identifying major gifts prospects. Yet the term major gifts itself has many different meanings depending on the organization and the context. So for the purpose of this webinar, we will utilize the term leadership annual gift to refer to the top gifts in the donor pyramid which are solicited annually. And then just quickly, I'd like to uh, recap the previous webinar series topics, which included communications, fundraising program evaluation, and board involvement in fundraising. These components are essential to a successful annual giving program, and the PowerPoint slides for these previous presentations can be accessed through the Alfred Group website. So this is what we will cover today, the six elements of success in annual giving, starting with case and communications, Okay, I think there's a technical issue with the uh, size of the slide that is projected on the screen. Hmm. I'll keep talking because you will eventually um, be able to catch up. We're going to look at case and communications, donor sources, goals and accountability, volunteer leadership, donor engagement plan, and resources that you need. So bear with us here. Um, we're going to look first at the case and communications for annual giving, and it's uh, appropriate to begin here as it's the first critical step in preparing for your annual giving program. Many fundraising professionals and even executive directors believe that they believe that they uh, inherently know their organization's case for support and indeed you know to an extent that's probably true however it's a best practice to articulate a case for support in writing refresh it or update it every year as part of the planning process there we are okay the case for support doesn't need to be lengthy or complex and it certainly doesn't need to be glossy the case for support is a written internal document that puts into writing collective ideas around a focused approach um, uh, for the year. But this written case for support does need to be thorough. It will remind the audience of the reason that your organization was founded, so you want to find ways to tell this story in a fresh way each year, and by all means, don't forget to tell this story. Savvy donors want to know about the bigger picture, about how their support will advance larger plans for the organization. So provide them with evidence that the case for support is linked to the annual, or rather to the strategic plan 
because this will engender uh, confidence in your donors. Provide a brief overview of the extent of the issue that you were founded to address and give an update each year about how your organization has impacted this need. You've probably heard about the proliferation of nonprofit organizations in America, and it is increasingly important to differentiate your organization from others <clears throat> that do similar work. And it's also very helpful to highlight collaborative relationships you may have. Finally, um, statistics are important, very important, but it's equally important to illustrate your impact with a story. Tell, tell of your impact in human terms. Keep it brief, but make sure that it illuminates your message in a new light. There are many uses for the case for support in an annual giving program, but you would never use it in its entirety, as, as we said before. It's an internal tool. For example, though, you uh, might excerpt uh, a program pr programmatic priority in a direct mail letter. You might weave together alternating threads of community need and organizational response to create a, a compelling tapestry in your direct mail text. Make sure that your annual report and newsletters harken back to the major themes of the year. And you don't need to worry about repetition of the same theme because this helps the reader retain the information. Acknowledgement letters can also make reference to these consistent themes. So I would admit that the challenge is to present consistent information yet in creative ways throughout uh, the course of the year in different formats. We talked about the um, value of a checklist in a medical setting, and actually there is application to other disciplines. So here is a quick and um, hopefully helpful checklist for a case in communications. You can read through it on your own. So what is a fit pitfall when it comes to case and communications? Here's an example. We've never written an annual case for support. And to be honest, we do sometimes have communications challenges between the ED development staff and program staff. But what difference will it really make if I write a case for support? Yes, I think a brief counseling session is in order. First of all, it's good that this person is circumspect about the situation and is certainly not in denial about the challenges in communications. It's not uncommon at all for this to happen and that really underscores the value of a shared case for support. So the key concept is that developing a case for support is a process that involves the executive director, program staff, finance staff, and others. The development director may coordinate the process but certainly it is not one person who develops the case in isolation. It will take time and effort, but by the end of the process, everyone will have greater clarity around a unified message. So next we'll take a look at donor sources needed for an annual giving program. The, the, in this step, we're looking at how you know your donors and align the channels for solicitation with them. So the four core sources of support for your annual giving program can include individuals, foundations, companies, and organizations. Um, in some cases, you may also add government to that list if your organization seeks support or could be seeking support, but we are not going to include that here. You should include it if it's relevant. The three core strategies, of course, when you're looking at your donor sources are identifying new donors and having recurring steps for identifying donor, new donor prospects systematically every year from, from places where you have learned you can find new donors, renewing donors where you involve a personalized approach based on identified interests and patterns of giving, and lapsed donors, letting them know you care and working towards recovering them as donors. Your plan also includes multiple channels and uh, trends, addressing trends in annual giving. Uh, the first is 
of course, personal solicitation. Then there are the mail appeals and direct mail, giving societies, benefit events, grants, sponsorships, social media leading to a website landing page, and telemarketing and cause marketing. How do we align these channels for individuals? Well, for most organizations, individuals represent the greatest potential for growth in an annual giving program. Focusing on renewing, upgrading, recovering, lapsed, and finding new donors, you will need to put in play various solicitation channels. In-person solicitation remains the most productive channel, for, especially for individual solicitation. In-house mail appeals and direct mail also remain robust, despite rumors to the contrary that online giving is overtaking the mail appeal. Giving societies that develop and recognize donors with capacity to give at higher levels are proven to be great drivers for growing your annual giving faster. Benefit events remain important, not just for the net revenue they generate, but also for the opportunity to find new donors and engage your volunteer leadership in helping to organize them. You're not likely to raise money or sell tickets through social media. Use social media to drive people to your website where they can take action. On your website, though, <clears throat> make sure everything is optimized and responsive based on the devices that people are using today. Make sure your bounce back thank you email is well thought out and meaningful if they gave online. And don't send a print appeal the next time. Try email appeal. If you are participating in giving days and give big, be very thoughtful about the way you are participating, incorporating your own participation into a bigger strategy with, with your own promotion and follow-up to drive people to a greater understanding of who you are and increase the likelihood that they'll give again. Then of course there's passive solicitation through any vehicle that you already have available to you through your organization's communications efforts over and above the development area. Newsletter inserts, the annual report, for example, um, and very importantly, if you have a membership renewal form or the RSVP cards for your events, both of those are great opportunities to ask for a contribution in addition to whatever else you're asking them to reply to. Aligning solicitation channels for foundations. Obviously, grant proposal renewals are the bread and butter of a lot of your foundation work. Uh, if you don't have a relationship with a foundation, an initial phone call is worth a try, even though I'm sure many of you have discovered that not all foundations will take a, a, a call from you. Some will welcome it, believe me. Um, and then there is the letter of inquiry to foundations to begin the exploration process of where their interests match your interests. And I mention appeals here because although typically you would not approach a foundation intentionally through a regular mail appeal, a number of our clients actually receive what adds up to be some significant um, revenue from the response that foundations make to appeal letters. So if you don't have a foundation on your um, agenda for the year and the time to get to everybody, just make sure to ask them with your best appeal letter. Corporations, the um, aligning your solicitation channels needs to be fairly well um, customized. Some for foundation, uh, some companies you'll be approaching through a grant request, others through a sponsorship, cause marketing, you might be asking for in-kind or the use of their facilities. Uh, we have been finding more and more that um, uh, companies are trending away from sponsorship alone. They want to see employee engagement as part of their relationship with you. And also you can engage companies through pro bono, pro bono services that they might be able to provide, for example, in uh, technology training, executive coaching, other kinds of management, uh, skill building for your team. And all of those ways add to your project of in further engaging your company donors. 
And again, I can't stress enough, if you won't be getting around to engaging everybody, all of your corporate sources, at least put them on your mailing list and make sure they're included in the most appropriate appeal mailing if you haven't approached them through another channel. Organizations can be very important for some nonprofit organizations' annual giving programs. And again, these might be civic and religious organizations in your community um, where they are actually representing a group of individuals, but for solicita solicitation purposes, we think of them as behaving kind of more like companies. So the larger organizations and nonprofits typically might include United Way, hospital and healthcare systems, local civic groups such as Rotary, and local religious institutions. You have an opportunity with some of these sources to spread the word about your organization through their newsletters and via speaking engagements. Depending though um, on the particular organization and your relationship with them, you need to try to align your solicitation channel to appeal to that organization in the best way. And once again, if you're, not, if you're not gonna be getting around to engaging all of your potential organizational sources, at least put them on your mailing list and include them in the most appropriate appeal mailing as well as mailings that will um, inform them about your work. So a very simple donor sources checklist, identify all the potential sources of support that might be relevant to your organization, whether or not you have a robust, robust program or any program at this point um, targeting that particular source. For each source and then within those sources, each potential donor, determine the best channel for solicitation. And don't forget to include those organizations for an ask. Too, too often we have um, organizations on our mailing list, but they don't even get asked because we're reserving them for some other special project. Okay, here is a common pitfall related to donor sources. Our donor acquisition efforts are fairly low key and our total donor numbers are declining each year. Okay, well, the, the, um, the nurse is calling for injecting new energy into your acquisition efforts. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that because of its importance to your ongoing strength of, uh, in annual giving. Okay, now we're gonna talk about goals and accountability. This is where the, the staff of an organization intersect with the senior staff and with the board. So it's a very important way, uh, area to really understand and to think about how you're going to handle. Um, you want to aim to inter incrementally grow your annual giving program each year, both in dollars but also in donors, the number of donors you have. So your goals should be reasonable yet challenging, and at the Alpha Group, we recommend that your goals even be greater than what your finance office budgets, because it never hurts to exceed expectations. Now, what are some considerations for how you set your goals? There are actually many factors that should influence you. Trends from prior years, number of prospects known to you, your assessment of the potential, which may be aided by wealth screening, or the number of appeals and channels you can reasonably implement, given your resources, the willingness and ability of your volunteer leadership to assist, the maturity of your annual giving program, because an immature program might be expected to double in you know, three to five years, but a more mature program that has already explored every possible avenue and relationship is going to grow on a much more um, incremental basis. Um, the economic climate and what has happened to giving trends nationally, locally, and in your sector, and whether you can secure a challenge gift or have some other moment on which you can lean for extra incentive for giving. And overall, you'll want to validate your annual goals. And we suggest somewhere between 3% and 10%, depending on how all these factors influence your organization. So we're gonna start off right away with looking at a, an annual giving gift table. 
Um, one tool for, for your goals is to, to actually construct a giving table like you would for a major gift campaign, but it's focused on your annual giving program. And to use this, you would actually list your real prospects from all sources, foundations, corporations, individuals, and organizations as part of the plan for each achieving each level within the work table. So this work table assumes that you're, you are going to have a goal of a million dollars and in terms of goals by size, which is one way to get there and to understand your strategy, you have um, built your table based on potentially two gifts at 50,000 for which you need about eight prospects six gifts at 25,000 for niche for which you need a four to one ratio of 24 prospects. And then you go down to a three to one ratio at the lower levels here for an annual giving program with the goal in this illustration of 10% of your donors bringing in 60% of your goal. And uh, what often for um, tracking annual giving over time it's advisable when you're doing your gifts by channel to potentially pull out your special gifts and grants as a separate line so that they don't skew the regular annual giving from individuals and overall smaller level gifts. This is an example um, of how you can use data from prior years to benchmark your assumptions for that gift table. Um, at this example is from Alfred Analytics, which we conduct as part of development assessments. And it helps us in building a gift table because we know what the last three years has looked like and how many gifts, as you can see at the top of this, this graph, there were three gifts uh, at the um, 50,000 and above level in 2015, totaling 225,000. And you can compare that to the previous two years where they brought in a little more from five donors in each year. So they need to look at who they lost and determine the feasibility of whether those people can be recovered at that level. And if there are individuals or foundations or corporations at the level below, that might be upgraded. And you take that on down. But in other words, you build your plan based on actual data. And this is another example similarly when we build our goals by solicitation channel, how we start from actual results. So this is a, an Alfred, Alfred Analytics graphic for one of our clients recently, showing how their sponsorship, their tribute income, their grants, their direct mail, and their special events uh, contributed to their annual giving program. And you can see right away where they have a huge dependence on special events. And when special events goes down by 100,000, that's going to impact their results. And so in planning a future uh, annual giving program, taking into account the need to diversify and the need to strengthen that special event and possibly put some effort in some other channels. And this is another um, uh, important tool for an annual giving program. Since annual giving, as any of you know, who has been involved, is driven by the solicitation calendar. This is not what your finance office is interested in seeing, but it's what the chief development officer is interested in seeing, and your organization depends on it. So it's even more important than in any other type of fundraising to stick to the deadlines for when your actual solicitations will take place. This is a very um, truncated, presentation to fit on a PowerPoint slide, but it should really be by month. This is consolidated by quarter here. But you should make your solicitation calendar based on the channel to be used for solicitation. And um, although a more complex version of this would show your segmentation choices, um, this calendar doesn't do that, but it doesn't mean that it's not assumed behind some of your approaches here. Um, your appeal should absolutely focus on categories of donors and prospects that you've identified and personalize all those contacts. So 
In addition to a calendar showing when you will conduct solicitations, annual giving results provide the ultimate form of accountability. So you'll also have and probably are required for your finance office to provide a monthly calendar of cash flow projections based on when your solicitations are made. But when you conduct, um, or, or the overall, I wanted to mention that the overall types of metrics really fall into two categories. These are the donor metrics, and then there are financial metrics. And both are really important and inform you in your planning. So donor metrics include the number of people who actually respond with gifts, how many donors, the number of new donors, the actual gross contributions received, the percent participation, literally dividing the participants by the total number of people that you um, solicited. And then the average gift size is always a helpful tool and can be looked at by your donor sources so that um, you understand the difference between the kinds of gifts you're going to be receiving depending on the donor sources you have. And then there are the financial metrics, which include obviously the cost of your annual giving program. And I'm sure many of you have found the various cost by specific program metric standards that you can use in reporting to your boards. And if people are interested, we can post that um, for you as a, an additional um, document from this webinar. Net income, which is very simple, income minus expenses. It's most important in looking at benefit events, actually. But your overall program as well, it's an interesting uh, statistic to have. Your average cost per gift, where again, you take your total expenses, you divide by your number of donors, and that gives you this um, uh, interesting uh, number to track from one year to the next to see if different strategies are costing you more or less per donor. Return on investment, which is one that the um, corporate members of your board are often asking about. Um, and it's important to understand how you calculate that. It's totally different from net income. Um, and then the most important one in our field is the cost of fundraising, which where you divide your expenses by your income. And I point you to the BBB Wise Giving, Better Business Bureau Wise Giving guidelines that are readily available online for how to actually you, um, add up the income that you should be including in this calculation. But you should educate your staff and board that cost of funds should be averaged over three years to account for outlier gifts and or especially difficult years or new strategies that you're trying that either worked great or need work. And notate your calculations for multiple year average cost of fundraising in your 990 presentation in GuideStar if it's significantly different from what would automatically be calculated when people look at your 990. So please follow those BB, BBB wise giving guidelines. And the checklist for goals and accountability have goals. Too many of our clients we've actually discovered didn't. Um, and that's the first remedy for that. Uh, do, uh, track dollars and also donors, track them by source, by size, by channel, have a solicitation calendar, and track your results by consistent metrics from one year to the next. Okay, here's a common pitfall related to goals and accountability in annual giving. We do fundraising each year, and of course we want to raise more money than the previous year, but we've never set specific goals. And there are so many factors beyond our control, such as the economy. Frankly, we don't even know how to get started. So now you do. Um, we've been providing some coaching and counseling here. It's all about looking at your actual donor sources and building on the past based on the actual plans you have, to grow, you have and that you make to grow your support. Write it down and discuss it with your team members, even if they aren't directly responsible for it, and create that plan. Okay, next we're going to look at board and volunteer leadership. 
It has been said that the three most important components of fundraising success are leadership, leadership, leadership. So let's look at what this entails. Volunteer leadership uh, in fundraising begins with the board. If they're not interested and involved in fundraising, why should anyone else be? And their involvement is essential in setting the example with 100 participation uh, of their own gifts each year. It's also a best practice for a board of directors to be divided into working committees, including a development committee. This is an opportunity to involve non-board members as well as board members. And one of the benefits of this strategy is that you can actually um, groom future board members through uh, watching people as they work, see who's dependable, see who's got great ideas, great energy, and, and it actually becomes a strategy that you don't necessarily spell out, but you can build into the process. Other potential volunteer leaders might include um, you know, multi, a multi-generational approach, alumni and past participants, certainly if you're a school or um, a healthcare organization, you have um, patients. And I would encourage you not to be afraid to look to diverse populations. Your board might end up, I mean, your volunteer corps might end up looking a little different than it has in the past, but that doesn't mean that it might uh, not work very well, and in fact, even there might be some surprises. And I'll uh, provide just one example. Uh, a few years ago, we had the pleasure to work with a board that included some youth representatives. So when the annual giving effort launched, one of the uh, youth board members uh, calculated how much he could afford from his part-time job each month. Then he multiplied that by 12, and put that on his pledge form, turned it in, and it was quite a surprise because the sum that he came up with was in several cases significantly higher than the pledge forms that had been returned by adult members of the board. And um, he actually helped to inspire others to aim much higher in their own giving. So all fundraising volunteers should be well prepared with basic yet essential education and training. This training should be done on an annual basis for everybody and yet as new members join the development committee, it may be worth your while to do small group trainings as well. You know, one good orientation session can provide a multitude of misunderstanding, misguided expectations and other potential pitfalls. We just love watching the light bulbs go off when we explain to a group of fundraising volunteers that fundraising is a process. It involves a lot of cultivation. Solicitation is only a tiny part of that process. We actually see people take a deep breath, their shoulders drop, and we're able to move on um, quite effectively. It is very important to have a written job description for volunteers, including the roles, their expectations, the time frame of their commitment, a pledge of staff support, and, and other factors. You never know when you might need to refer back to a written job description in case there is a misunderstanding in the course of a year. Be sure to share the annual development plan so that volunteers will understand cycles, peak periods of activities, etc., and they won't have um, uh, unrealistic expectations of staff or of activities. Show how subcommittees, the fundraising committee or even uh, smaller subcommittees are related to the development committee and how this committee is related to the board so that there is um, um, an understanding that there are approval processes and actually the work that you do builds into the larger picture. When you provide your training, make it um, interactive to, to the extent that's possible because then people will retain the information better and you know I mean make it fun there are ways to do this even when people are kind of fearful about the process there are certainly lots of strategies that can inject fun into this process at the end of each fundraising cycle or fiscal year or however you gauge your cycle be sure to report on success to your volunteers and uh, teach them the concepts of return on investment and other indicators that you use. 
And I'm a big believer in celebrating your success or just the completion of your year. Make it fun, informative, make it delicious. In other words, be sure to have some snacks. And it's helpful to take um, a fun a celebration off-site to maybe someone's home so that it can feel like a real special occasion. It can even be something that people look forward to each year. So the checklist, the handy checklist for working with volunteers. Uh, work within the board and committee structure that's already in place. Look broadly um, for additional and diverse volunteer leadership. Communicate well and in, in advance. And start simple. You know, um, thank you calls are the easiest way for volunteers to be involved uh, in the fundraising process, they're also the most pleasant and can be very rewarding. And once they, they master the, um, the uh, challenge of picking up the phone and dialing a stranger's number and they have good experiences, you know, they'll come back and say, well, what else can I do to help? Uh, and remember to say thank you to your volunteers. It's not just donors who need to hear those magic words. So the number one pitfall, we don't formally ask board members, members to give each year. They already know what needs to be done and it's really not our place to tell them. Some give a gift each year, so what's the problem? Oops. Okay, so I sense uh, some, some anxiety in this question, so perhaps a dose of anti-anxiety medication may be in order. You know, we've talked about fundraising being a, prob a process and a team sport. So in this case, involving the board chair may help to alleviate the anxiety of the development director. So work with the chair and, and others on the board. Provide information such as we've covered. And it may be helpful to borrow, for as an example, a board member pledge form from another organization to illustrate that, hey, this is what other boards do. Maybe we could work toward this process. So your donor engagement plan, this is what will distinguish your organization from others with your donors. A successful annual giving program will, will build relationships with its donors as key stakeholders, not merely as objects to target for transactional gifts. So that um, this is the engagement continuum, and hopefully you've all seen it before. There's an art and science to fundraising, and we start with identify. This is the seven I's. You have to identify your new donors. You have to invite them to, to learn about the organization. Then you have to inform them about the organization. You have to get them interested, and then you need to get them involved. And the last step is really to invest them as donors and they will then become uh, your advocates and they will want to see you be successful. And in our, in our experience, uh, in this process, one of the great pitfalls is not having a systematic approach to identifying the new donors. The very beginning of the, the continuum here of identifying new donors. Um, and while that is relatively easy for an educational institution that has new graduates every year, it's not so easy or transparent how to go about this for a human service organization, an environmental adv advocacy organization, and, and many others with whom we've worked. For some, there are logical places to look for new pro prospects, such as new subscribers to an arts organization or a museum or new members um, or recent patients of a healthcare institution, but the process has not been made robust or recurring. And we attribute this lapse to the fact that new donors often give the smallest gifts, at least initially. But we also know that you will naturally lose donors each year. So without a systematic way to replenish your donor pool, it will begin to decline and eventually impact your overall results. But the process of the continuum is a cycle. And once you have an invested donor, it behooves you to take the steps that are needed to um, cultivate them through that continuum for larger investments in your organization. How often and what format should your cultivation efforts take? We recommend seven touches a year, but most of them shouldn't be the ask, or at least the asks should be less, fewer than the touches overall. Um, 
we should begin to be tracking with our fancy software systems available to us now what donors interests are how they respond and and take that into account in our relationship building so the stewardship checklist um, is practicing the seven eyes of the engagement continuum promptly thanking donors within 48 hours is the standard we recommend if a gift was made online don't just allow the the uh, bounce back thank you to be the only way the donor hears from you, send a personal email, even a written note. Personal and accurate thank you notes, and within your thank you notes, figure out how you express your gratitude at least twice. And finally, ongoing donor communication, which is part of that continuum, to let people know what your organization has been doing with the resources it has successfully raised. Okay, here's a common pitfall in cultivation and stewardship. Our communications manager removed all board members and volunteers from our mailing list. He thinks they shouldn't be spammed with email, newsletters, and direct mail appeals. And apart from spamming them, he thinks that all volunteers should not be asked for financial support because they already contribute their time. The decision maker needs to understand the importance of regular communication with all of your constituencies and that mail and correspondence is not automatically spam. That's our advice for today on that. Hey, let's take a look at uh, resources allocated. It's more than just a cliche that it takes money to raise money. Nonprofit leaders must thoroughly understand the role of staff, budget, and infrastructure in fundraising success. So the first question, that may sound absurd. Absurd. Do you have any staffing? Well, the question really is, do you have any staff um, that is uh, dedicated to fundraising? Have you identified someone as the point person for the fundraising process? That is important, whether or not that person shares um, many functions. Um, as a general guideline, in a mature uh, fundraising shop, each professional fundraiser who works in donor solicitation, whether they're the annual giving manager, the membership manager, major gifts officer, or what have you, uh, might reasonably be expected to generate between five and six times their salary in philanthropic revenue each year. Of course, this depends on many factors, such as do you have an existing pipeline of, of prospects prospective donors that a new staff person could immediately tap into, that's one situation. Now, if, if your situation is that, no, you have to raise awareness of your organization, you have to grow support, that's a very different situation. Do you have uh, adequate infrastructure and um, experience on staff to tap into prospective donors? You know, those are uh, questions to consider before you can justify bringing in more fundraising staff. You know, if your, if your shop, your fundraising shop is fairly small, even though you feel overworked, if you raise only about $100,000 per year, for example, it may be difficult to justify additional staff at this time. But as I said, there are many factors to take into consideration. And then on the other hand, and this is a big uh, uh, switch of perspective, there be the organizational will and strategy to deliberately expand fu fundraising efforts and in this case the board and and uh, executive director and others may approve an investment of several staff members over the course of a couple years um, just to kind of jump start um, a more mature and robust fundraising program. In this case, it's important to remember that it may take up to three years for these efforts to produce results at a mature level. So let's look at the uh, actual resources in budgetary terms. You know, revenue is one thing, Amy's talked about that. The expense side of the equation is listed here. And this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. This is uh, um, really more useful uh, from the standpoint of these line items may frequently be overlooked in the budget planning process. So we want to put them here for your, for your use. Um, 
I wanted to talk about uh, the, the resources on the previous slide. So the training, this will, would include training and database use for current staff if they haven't had the training, or it's helpful to budget for new staff who may come in over the course of the year and may need this. Um, subscriptions <clears throat> included in this line item might be services such as wealth screening, prospect research, grant research, other types of data that are uh, specialized services. Professional development would include um, attendance at workshops and conferences, membership in AFP, things like that. Vendors would include the mail house that processes your direct mail, or if you utilize a firm for a phonathon, that would go in this line item. Now, office supplies and, and printing, that's, that's fairly clear cut, but the important thing is to look at the annual um, calendar of fundraising activities that Amy has talked you through and project when the great big spikes are going to happen and be sure that you budget accordingly. And then as you work with your leadership annual donors, those at the top of the pyramid, you may have additional expenses related to, you know, lunch meetings or small private uh, cultivation events and things like that. So you want to be sure that you're not limited by budget in working with the top of your donor pyramid. So Joanne, I'm going to jump ahead a little in the interest of time um, and, and to the, the final really important area we wanted to introduce today. Okay, that sounds great. These slides will be available online to everybody. I know some folks have been asking. Um, culture of philanthropy is um, an important yet intangible factor. Basically, in a nutshell, it's the understanding that everyone in an organization has an important role in fundraising. Uh, the, the CEO may believe that, well, I've hired a, a very experienced and savvy uh, director of development. Uh, you know, my role has been diminished. Well, no, it's, it's the role of the director of development to familiarize and educate the CEO in his or her role and to make them effective in that process. Program staff can be tremendously effective in the fundraising process, particularly with cultivation, as you can imagine. But I would argue, we would argue that all other staff have important supporting roles in fundraising, and we mean literally all other staff. Anyone who picks up the phone and might talk to a prospective donor, you know, any anyone who um, uh, greets someone as they walk in the door, they need to be able to answer the question, where is the development office or where is the foundation? And they need to uh, be able to provide that level of customer service. I'm going to skip this pitfall, Joanne, just okay, to... Okay, that's fine. So the annual giving checklist overall, we um, recommend agreeing on a theme based on your case that all sources are considered as potential donors and aligned, that you have a plan starting with goals and a method for evaluating results, an engagement and stewardship plan with a personal touch driving your decisions, an ask of everyone, and allocate the resources you need, and take advantage of your entire team's knowledge. Another of Atul Gawande's great lines, man is fallible, but maybe men are less so. So turn to your team. So to wrap up the medical metaphor, there are many challenges and pitfalls in annual giving, but we're happy to report that the prognosis is good. There are many and varied treatment options available. We often recommend a combination or a progressive uh, treatment course. Uh, don't be afraid to try what may seem like alternative medicine. If it's something you haven't tried before, give it a try. You know, maybe not in a blanket format, but certainly uh, try new things. Um, we've uh, inserted some checklists that you can use. We encourage their use uh, if they're helpful to you. And then, um, in fundraising, as in medicine, let's remember the wisdom of Hippocrates. First, do no harm. <laughs> and then there are many helpful resources available online and in other formats. Some are um, free to utilize, so we encourage you. Um, AFP, you know, is, is our professional organization. It's a tremendous national and even international resource. So we encourage your participation in local activities as well as 
uh, visiting the content-rich website, and even considering attending the international conference. Okay, I'm going to jump in. This is Sharon Tickness with a question that we received. Uh, this, this questionnaire says, my executive director came back from a conference with a big idea. He suggests that we should develop a gift club, and he wants me to put it in place in time to meet our newsletter deadline next week. Is this a good idea? Joanne, take that one. Oh, my goodness. I wish that this were just uh, fictional, but, um, you, you know, uh, we hear this more often than we would like. A great new idea. Let's implement it next week. Um, you know, let's, let's think about donor-centered fundraising and, and the overall strategy behind gift clubs. You know, they're useful as motivators when donors are considering future gifts, not so much retroactively as a label just to apply to past gifts. Also, you want to give careful format, uh, a careful consideration to the format that a gift club might take because this is going to be a long-lasting program. You don't want to um, act in haste and repent in leisure. And consider um, involving your development committee because two heads are better than one, six heads are better than two. You know, you may come up with some really great ideas if you involve others. Thank you. And I'm just going to get one more question out there. One of our uh, the participants today um, shared that their volunteers like to produce events and that primarily their organization is focused on raising money through events. They currently have um, two or three major events each year and they don't do other types of solicitation. So what would you recommend in terms of um, whether or not they should cut events? Joanne? Oh. Me? Yeah, I, I've, I've certainly seen this. I think, I think we've all seen it. Um, you know, special events are the costliest of the fundraising methods that, that we have at our disposal, and they are um, labor intensive as well. They can exhaust, exhaust staff, volunteers, and, and even the donors. So make sure that you understand that. Um, uh, that you, you're going to want um, a written plan outlining uh, your goals and assumptions for income and expenses and any other benefits. You know, sometimes it really is warranted if you need to raise awareness, you need to um, bring together more people to achieve that synergy for your organization, but you need to be really clear on why you're using events um, repeatedly and you don't just want it to be a default activity. Well, thank you, Joanne, for that answer as well, and to you and Amy for a great presentation and discussion. We've learned a lot about how best to analyze and perform surgery on our annual giving programs. Uh, we all seek to be high-performing professionals, and you've given us some great tools and tips um, or perhaps reminders of the things that we can all do to strengthen annual giving and create a strong culture of philanthropy within our organizations and among our donors. Um, I want to call your attention uh, so you know this is the fourth webinar in the Alfred Group Summer Webinar Series. You can see here the next two that are scheduled. Uh, we invite you to join us on September the 8th for Beyond Gold, Silver, and Bronze, Creating Meaningful Partnerships and co with Corporations with our colleague Diane, Diane Konopke. We encourage you to register for one or both of these listed here and simply uh, register for free by going to the Alpha Group's webpage and you'll receive an email later today with a link to register as well as a recording of today's presentation and the full slide deck that we have just gone through. We're also going to have a very short survey and asking you to share with us how, how we did and uh, what you learned and what you would, um, what we can take away. We pride ourselves at the Alpha Group in being a learning organization and we thank you for helping us to always be a great resource to you. So thank you everyone for joining us. We hope to see you in two weeks for the next webinar. This concludes today's webinar and we're going to now disconnect. Have a great day.